Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, episode three of State of the Collection. Now, if you missed episode one, where I looked at divers, and episode two, where I looked at my aviation pieces, have a look back. Now, I'll do a quick wristwatch check before we get into today's episode. I am wearing the Jujara Design Seiko Ripley watch, and I have to say, it is terrific fun to be reacquainted with this piece, something that you do get with a larger collection after not seeing a piece for a little while. Anyway, without further ado, let's change perspectives, roll the intro and get into today's episode. Uh, today I'm going to discuss dress watches and everyday watches, which, to be honest, is not a genre of watch. Well, everyday watches, that's quite a broad uh, spectrum, but dress watches is not something that I was typically into. However, it, it's, you know, as tastes evolve and change, uh, as we get older, as we learn more about watches, and, and our tastes evolve as well, uh, so does your uh, collection respectively. Anyway, um, so a quick peek at the Snups uh, watches given away or sold, gone but not forgotten. Um, any watches? Yeah, the, the Henry Mark II has gone, which is the entirely stainless steel uh, with the smooth bezel. What else has gone uh, from this genre? Well, the Iris Moon Phase, that went donkeys ago. And then there's the, the, the original Henry, but that also went uh, a while ago. This I had for over a year and a bit of an inspiration for this latest Tudor. But anyway, so where should we begin? Well, uh, first of all, let me just explain a little disclaimer. This is not a review of each particular watch. It's just the kind of overview of how my feelings have changed about each particular piece, uh, how it has evolved over the year. Perhaps my perceptions changed and also uh, if you want an individual review on any of these pieces, um, have a look at uh, previous videos, you know, because I have reviewed all of these extensively with, you know, going into all the intricacies of their specifications and all the rest of it. This is my ultra luxury, look at that blue from Coloreb, as you can see there. Uh, you You would have seen over these episodes various um, types of watch cases. This... As, as we're talking about dress watches, I, I feel something a little bit more um, high class, shall we say, is needed. Look at this. I mean, this is handmade in Italy, this wonderful distressed dyed blue leather. It's just, oh, it's so good. You want to eat it. This is great for a weekend away. And it, that's the nice thing about, uh, that is the nice thing I should say, sorry, forgive my <laughs> terrible English, uh, about having watch cases of all different sizes um, for, for various, you know, the, the, the the length of trip may vary and you know I'm always gonna carry multiple watches wherever I go so for a weekend uh, if you're on a watch obsessive then <laughs> four watches is probably enough and then one on each wrist where should we start well let's start with this little darling in the corner it is of course my 60s Timex Marlin this has to stay no date manual wind I forget the year but you can find out from the number reference at the bottom made uh, at the Dundee plant in the United Kingdom uh, just a wonderful affordable watch the secret is out on the Marlin you know they've uh, since I got this they've reissued it a slightly more 60s style numerals I love these blocky almost deco-esque numerals that beautiful sunburst style this is of course the pin and plate very rudimentary movements but rock solid they do operate slightly slower speed so you see that choppy uh, seconds but they're built like tanks and as the saying goes as their marketing goes uh, it takes a licking but keeps on ticking and it really did get a lot of the watch industry scared because these were just so solid performers and yeah i love it i can't remember the size i think it's about 33 34 millimeters wonderfully slender and thin with domed crystal of course chrome plated bezel stainless steel back yeah there we go dust proof waterproof yeah picked this up for 
can't remember now, I think it was about 40, 40 bucks um, at the time. The, the price has escalated, doubled, tripled even, especially on the, the Great Britain made 12, 3, 6 and 9. I, I love the balance. Yeah, this is the golden age of Timex really is. I mean, what more can I say? And I've got it on a playful purple NATO strap from, uh, I can't remember what they're called. I think they're cheap NATO straps or cheap NATO straps.com or something to that effect. They have got the best variety of colors. Yeah, I know NATO straps not for everyone, but oh well. And then we have um, old old Henry, the Henry Mark III. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> Gorgeous. 36 millimeter with the ETA 2834, I think it is. Day date, 14 carat, yellow gold, two-tone. This is an aftermarket jubilee, and you can probably tell because, well, this is only gold plated, and the, 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 the luster of the gold is slightly different, and the end links, these horrible hollow end links don't fit as well but you know I love that Bateman um, Jubilee effect and I really do feel that this is the best luxury watch under two thousand dollars the dial is exquisite I've, I've never really been into white dials but this is gorgeous it gives that effect of almost being like um, enamel reminds me of my grandfather's pocket watch actually the, the Frodsham it's just something very classic about a white dial with Romans the, the way these are applied and plays with the light incredibly elegant it's a handsome piece it really is a great complication for every day you know the only criticism is well some people have said oh I th actually I think I've got a comment saying oh it's an old man's watch well I kind of like that sometimes you want something that's a little bit mature a little bit traditional and it gives that feeling of, of date just I've owned so many date just over the years I like the fact that it's Tudor and not a Rolex that's another criticism people will say oh it's the poor man's Rolex. Well, it was always supposed to be and intended as the more affordable alternative to, to Rolex. Some of the old ones had, if you remember, my, my Henry Mark I had the Rolex crown on the, on the, um, sorry, that, yeah, the Rolex crown on the crown. There you go. <laughs> this is the last generation before the Tudor made the switch to the Glamour. The Glamour is a lot more of its own thing. This is very... Rolex-esque, which I like. I have no issue with that. You know, you got all the benefits of Rolex, the oyster case, the quality and the polishing and, and, and the detail. And it is absolutely perfect, um, but with a more affordable movement. And that's what it's all about. And I have serviced, which I can't remember which of my Tudors I serviced. I think it was the Henry. To get that ETA service, it wasn't that much. It was 200 bucks compared to, as we speak, I'm getting my wife's date just serviced. And that's 500 dollars and that's not even the full servicing so that's not including any cosmetic changes if i just pop it on the wrist this is my sweet spot i love the size and feel of this i love the fact that it's got a hold case it's it's it is a strap monster this on a on a crocodile or, or a lizard skin strap it would just look absolute the kipper's knickers the, the, the bee's knees it would just look pure class it really would equally so for for the Timex, you know, this is just a wonderful size for the smaller wrist. And, uh, and it's, if you see that uh, poster with um, Rocky Masciano wearing this, you know, still, you know, w when people say, oh, it's a woman's watch, which I just find incredible. But for most of wristwatch history, you know, the smaller sizes, that was the norm for a man. And it's going back that way, which is great. And I think actually every single watch here is under 36 or about that. Yeah, there's nothing here. Anyway, yeah, let's move on. Ah, the Hammy. The Hamilton. Here we go. So this is a really interesting piece, mainly because of the history behind it. This contains the micro rotor, hence why it's so slender. This is a 33 millimeter piece, solid 10 karat gold case. A rather subtle, but it is sunburst effect. It's not as pronounced as we compare to the, um, the Timex there but incredibly bewitching all the same. Wonderful Dorfin hands. I've put it on this, uh, where is this from? Handmade in Deutschland. So this is a Hirsch. This you can get on Holbens, a beautiful blue suede. I wanted something elegant 
and dressy, but not too overpowering like a glossy strap, because this is quite a subtle watch. Very Madman era, 60s, Finomatic, as you can see, masterpiece. Such a, a befitting name, because this is actually Hamilton's masterpiece. Hamilton acquired Buren, who famously made the Micro Rotor. There was a race between them and Universal Genève, if you remember. So this is the Calibre 620. It's still debated hotly who was first, but Hamilton loved them so much they actually bought the company and incorporated them into their watches. Uh, look at that UFO case, incredibly slender. This is really the quintessential dress watch in my opinion. I love the applied numerals also in solid gold. Uh, th there's something about this layout which I'm just a sucker for. Um, I don't know why, I, pff, I don't know what it is. It's just, there's a, there's a, there's a purity, there's a, there's a kind of gracefulness about having just 12, three, six, and nine. So this is from 1966 and you see the old school Hamilton logo there. And in my opinion, I think this is the pinnacle of Hamilton's watchmaking. You know, this was when they were making the case, manufacturing, everything was put together in the United States because obviously they were such an uh, iconic American brand, but the movements, and this is their higher end movements. I don't think it ever got higher end for a Hamilton than this. You can see there, 67. This was given to somebody who worked at um, Ralston Purina, or Purina, however you want to pronounce it. I, I like this because it gives it a story and it also dates the watch. I mean, the watch is actually from 1966, but uh, this was uh, purchased and given inscribed or, or given um this is this is a lovely old tradition people don't do this anymore it's a real crying shame yeah and I, I even like the way the gold has started to tarnish it it is quite used but unpolished all entirely original uh, a real sweet spot and you know what the new thinomatics because they did reissue them not not too long ago actually they don't have any of the charm or character of these in my opinion obviously if you want something a bit more large and contemporary but the whole point of the thinomatic was to utilize that micro rotor the micro rotor uh, miniaturized and, and put inside being embedded within the movement instead of uh, mounted on top and therefore enabling it to be so slender. And you see micro rotors typically synonymous with Hawk horology and high-end watchmaking. But anyway, and here we have a Darling Hamilton. I, I just love the history, the, I mean, genuine historicity. Let's just pop it on the wrist, hold on. Look at that. So, oh God, it's so slender. I mean, that is what a good dress watch should be. Nine millimeters tall. It's got a story to it. It's got some history. It's a precious metal. It's elegant. It's understated. It's not loud. You've got some real watchmaking prowess in it. Slender to slide under the cuff. Anyway, yeah, I don't wear it enough. I really should wear it more often. Good to have some an American classic in the collection. And I just realized we haven't mentioned this, which I did kind of premiere in my um, live show. If you guys have been following, I repurchased the Belova Actron recently. This is a space view, hugely iconic and important milestone in uh, not only American uh, history, but uh, American horology. So I sent it back. It was the Goldfield version slightly earlier. And I, I guess you could say I upgraded to this 1962 forget the guy's name, but I've bought four Accutrons off him over the, <laughs> over the last couple of years. Most of them are given away as gifts or for myself. I really wanted this and I saw he had it. And so I decided to send the other one back and I kind of had to pay a little bit extra. Uh, this is 600 rather than the 400 of the previous. This is the later 1962 uh, with the chapter ring. Now this is not original in terms of being vintage. This is new old stock parts put together. Uh, some of the Bulova purists, Accutron purists, turn their noses up at this, uh, which is just ridiculous. There's nothing wrong with buying, a, a, you know, as long as they're restored by a competent and, and reputable watchmaker like my guy, then it's fine, you know. Um, if you're buying a period correct, entirely original one, you're gonna look at 2,000 thereabouts so this is a much more affordable and also this is you know new battery all the parts are, are, are relatively new some are re you know resourced just amazing no crown this is the 214 movement same as before just different handset 
different crystal and the chapter ring as well. And I went through the stainless steel, um, just a little bit better for every day. And you know what? The first day wearing this, I got three compliments on it. So, so far in the whole history of all of my watches, this has got more compliments in the shortest amount of time. And it still does. I think I've got since that day, two or three more compliments. It's, it's a great conversation start. The precursor to quartz, you know, a technology that was so revolutionary at the time in, in, in the late 50s, early 60s, that the CIA, because they, they, they were using it in spy satellites, the CIA actually made Bulova delay the commercial release of this because they didn't want, you know, this is the height of the Cold War. They didn't want the so-called enemy at the time to have access to this kind of technology. And then, of course, it all changed when Quartz in 69, because uh, this is powered by these magnets that uh, operate at this incredible high frequency, thus allowing that butter smooth sweep of the seconds hand, but also a supreme accuracy. And they hum wonderfully. Uh, they're a design icon. This one was famously worn. The 62 version, as you see here, is famously worn by Richard Rogers. So that was also part of my decision um, to upgrade to this one. I wanted to get a similar to the one he wore. Um, he's a, a massive idol and, and kind of role model of mine. He's such an eloquent, clever, cultured uh, British Italian architect that, um, you know, I grew up in London amongst his architecture and I've, I've always been fascinated and it's important, you know. And you know what's interesting about the space view? It was never intended actually to look like this. These were store display models because to, to show off the movement and then they kind of took off and Belova decided, you know what, we'll we'll release it like this, kind of, I guess you could say semi-skeletonized. And people were just bewitched. I mean, at the time, it still looks high tech, but at the time, you gotta remember, these timepieces were the cutting edge of technology. I mean, they were very futuristic. It does have a kind of forbidden planet aesthetic, um, that retro sci-fi look that is just so alluring it's it's oh it's sublime i i had to have one in the in the collection and not to mention you know their their brand from new york founded in new york uh, they're still headquartered here now part of citizen let's move on to something uh, a little bit higher end yeah this is my holy trinity hort horology piece uh, not my first hort horology piece i, I started with the frodsham it has the caliber 2124 that was made originally by Jaeger Lecoultre at JLC. Uh, and you'll find this caliber in various Royal Oaks. So it's Adamar Piguet calendar with day of the week, day date, and the moon phase there. This, to me, if my grandfather was still alive uh, and he wasn't wearing his pocket watch, I could see him buying this. This is so classic. And this has actually made me fall in love and appreciate Adamar Piguet on such a different level. I admit to this, I kind of dismiss them just as the makers of the Royal Oak, uh, which is, I love the Royal Oak, I've grown to love it, but I'm not a fan of the offshores and those big, big Royal Oaks, you know? It was synonymous with bling and, and it just, for me, I never got into AP. And then I discovered this, I bought this, and then I started learning about the brand, their independence, the fact they're still family owned. And they just have so many amazingly classic, elegant watches like this that are kind of forgotten about. So this came out in, in the 80s. There was a perpetual calendar version with an extra uh, kind of um, tri-compax layout that was famously worn by Bill Murray in uh, Scrooge. This, I've started referring to it as the Sultan because <laughs> I, since reviewing it, found out that the Sultan of Oman actually owned one. It was uh, uh, sold at Christie's. So I've, I've started calling it the Sultan and you, you see that amazing enamel dial, the way the light, this is real enamel dial. Again, something that harkens back to the pocket watch of my grandfather. Blued hands, of course, on the sub dials. The hand painted moon phase with that beautiful little twinkle of gold with the stars and the moon. The way the sub dial at the six o'clock is framed, just a tiny bit of uh, gold there. Solid 18 carat with a satin finish on the sides and then um, high polish for the, the stepped, slightly decoish bezel. Black lacquer uh, 
Roman numerals. Again, a little classic nod to more traditional pocket watches. And I've put it, well, where's the original strap? I think it's in here. Where is the original? Oh, there it is. Yeah, this is the original strap, uh, but I didn't want to scratch up the, the buckle. Um, there's the, the, the gold 18 karat buckle because, I mean, this is a lovely strap, but I put it on the red. This is a genuine crocodile from uh, Tech Swiss or Swiss Tech, I can never remember. I think lug width should have been a, a, a flick smaller, slender, because the strap does tend to overpower it. However, on this strap, it gives it a very reassuring um, fit. You know, once on the wrist, it, it sits marvelously well, as you can see there. So it's absolutely fine. Incredibly slender, 33, 34 millimeters, eight millimeters tall, which is just amazing considering it is an automatic with such complications. I mean, yeah, really quite astounding, but you know, uh, that's the strength of JLC's watchmaking. Uh, even though obviously AP had modified it um, to a great extent. Just a two-hander, again, in that traditional sense of a dress watch where you want to know the time, but you don't want to know the precise time to such an extent that you're counting the seconds. It's a very, very, very traditional. And the other critique, which you could also argue is a strength of this watch, is that all the, the, the settings are done via one crown. There's no pushers or anything else, which is quite astounding. So on the one level, it shows you the mastery of watchmaking involved, the complexity of this movement. But on the negative, you know, when setting all these features, you have to put it to six, uh, you have to put it to 12 o'clock, then wind it back, then fourth, and... There's all these procedures to, to get, you know, a to set the date and the day, but so worth it because it is incredibly sublime to look at. It's just so refined and so understated and classy. And, and this to me is what a, a dress watch should, should be, you know? So yeah, I, I, I'm over the moon with, well, pun not intended. <laughs> I'm over the moon with this. Yeah, anyway, let's move on. And here we have the little Lord Sanford, the skin diver, this peculiar little lost gem from the 60s, uh, very much inspired by the Ranchero from Amiga and the Railmaster 2. And again, you see the 12, 3, 6, and 9. I just love that layout. Wonderful patinaed loom. The video I did for this was re quite interesting because I enjoyed puzzling together the story behind this, um, I guess you could say, a, a lost, forgotten brand, the unusual name. I love its slenderness, this angular, quite long lugs, domed crystal, the arrow hand, obviously. It's just a bit of fun, and, and you know, I'm a big fan of the, um, the Railmaster Explorer 1016. Those are expensive, so to get one of the same period that, that looks almost, well, very similar but yet has its own little quirks. So yeah, just a harmless bit of fun. I, I think it's, I don't know about the movement. It's a little 17 jewel uh, manual wine. I'm just gonna pop it on, hold on. And I like the fact that, you know, it, it's a bit of a mystery. I, I enjoyed puzzling together the story behind it and trying to la locate, um, you know, by, by taking it apart and, and finding numbers and, and the, the manufacturer of the movement and the manufacturer of the case and all this. I, I still don't know the complete story. It just shows that you could still find cracking little vintage pieces that, that are enjoyable, um, that are, are period correct alternatives to, to some quite rare and desired watches. So yeah, for a couple of hundred dollars, it, it's just a great little find. And I also like the fact that, um, you know, you're, you're not going to see another one of these about. Uh, so really, really cool. Anyway, let's move on. And, and that kind of brings us on nicely to the last watch of this section of the collection. And it is my favorite watch. It, it has become my favorite watch. In fact, I, I need to wear it a little bit more. But this obviously is the Rolex Explorer, there we go. So this is the reference 114270 with the caliber 3130 inside. Ah, what can I say? Well, I've owned this over a year now. Uh, I've got it on a distressed collar. I can't remember if this is the Siena or the Roma or uh, maybe it's the Firenze. No, I don't think it's the Firenze. But anyway, there will, there will be a link to this on my Amazon, which is in my dis linked in the description. We, or if you're in Europe, you can go to Coloreb directly and order from them. 
and they are also on Holborns. So the Rolex Explorer, why is it my favorite? Well, in many ways, it kind of encapsulates me. It's, it's, um, well, now that sounds a bit pretentious, but it has everything that I love about a watch. It's got an incredible heritage and history. It's got the connotations of adventure, um, not only with its founding roots with uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and, and that oyster perpetual that he had that became the explorer with his expedition to Mount Everest. But later, you know, with Fleming adopting it as his watch. And in many ways, I, I do think it is actually the original James Bond watch, the 1016. I wish I could have one. I'm contemplating maybe it's a grail, who knows. And then we have the modern version. It's understated. It's it, There's a simplicity about it. It's the Rolex... That, that is the least amount of flashy. And it's funny because when I started really getting into watches, I considered the, the Explorer boring and I, I dismissed it. Now I appreciate it so much more. I love its slenderness. I love the fact that it has no date. It's an absolute strap monster. You've got the oyster case with the 100 meters with the screw down uh, crown. Any situation, dress, formal, casual, smart, swimming, whatever you know it, it could just take it built like an absolute tank and you know well i've discussed the 3130 in when quite a lot of detail i'm not going to go over it but i just adore it it's got a little bit of england in it uh, with its history i love as you've seen now i i, I have a thing obviously for uh, nine six and three numerals uh, but the triangle in this it just ugh. The Explorer Dial is such a classic. I love this reference as well. If I was going to get a 1016, I'd still keep this. I'd still keep this. I love the new ones. And in many ways, I kind of want to have the, 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 the loomed numerals. But at the same time, I do like how these play with the light, uh, the applied numerals. I do like that. Let's just pop it on from old time's sake. So let's give that some scenario. The house is on fire. You've got to grab one watch. Grab this and you're good to go, you know? It's the, the Rolex that, it doesn't have any of that negative stigma, luxury stigma, it's still a tool watch, it's still, there's a purity to it, there's an honesty, there's a very similitude about it that I can't deny. It took a little bit of a time for me to really appreciate this, you know? It's absolute pure class, it really is. Uh, I keep in my collection. It's that one watch that, if I only had to have one watch, which I would hate, that would be, uh, the equivalent of purgatory for me, but um, yeah, this is this is unequivocally it. I absolutely adore it, and you're probably going to get sick of me just <laughs> going on and on about it. But yeah, there we go, there we go. It's unpretentious. It's just it's me down to a T. It is me down to a T. It really is. Right. Well, I guess I should address. Well, we all know which is my favourite, the Rolex Explorer. There, uh, which are staying, which are going. I think there is a lot of overlap with this type of dial, um, possibly the, the Hamilton, which is really gonna be sad, but I, I just don't wear it enough to warrant keeping it. Um, so I'm probably gonna let that one go. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Quite remarkable to see that this has become such a dominant and, and constantly growing part of my collection. Uh, who would have thought it? So many dress watches or everyday watches. Please do nominate your favorite dress and everyday watch in the comments below. I'd love to hear that. I really do enjoy hearing um, your nominations. So please do share that in the comments. So thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao. This is a public service reminder for the good gentry. Please follow us on Instagram, join the Facebook UGWC group and click on the bell to keep notified of new videos. Don't forget to keep it positive, keep it gentry, onwards and upwards. Thank you.